Hello and welcome to Digest This, where we focus on day-to-day clinical issues in gastroenterology. I'm Elaine Robertson, a gastro trainee in the west of Scotland. Today we're discussing PSC, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr Mike Williams, a consultant here at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. Welcome Dr Williams and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you for the invitation. So, can you start off just with a bit of background? What is PSC and who's the typical patient? PSC is a rare form of chronic liver disease characterised by multifocal inflammatory biliary strictures and progressive liver fibrosis that results in cirrhosis. It's got a strong association with inflammatory bowel disease or IBD and there's a strong male preponderance, so the male to female ratio is around two to one. It can present at any age from childhood onwards, but the typical age of presentation is around 40. So I guess the typical patient would be a young to middle-aged man with ulcerative colitis and cholestatic liver tests. And do we know what causes it? PSE has always been considered as one of the autoimmune liver diseases despite having some atypical features such as the male preponderance and a lack of response to immunosuppression. But there is increasing evidence now to support an autoimmune cause. Some genome-wide association studies show quite strong HLA linkage that overlaps with other autoimmune diseases. So there is a genetic predisposition, but as with many other autoimmune diseases, there's often then a presumed environmental trigger There's been a lot of speculation as to what that might be. The link with inflammatory bowel disease has led to a lot of speculation about a role of gut microbiota or the passage of inflammatory stimuli from the gut into the portal circulation. There's some evidence for homing of gut-specific lymphocytes to the liver due to overlapping cell adhesion signaling. But at the moment, it's not clear what the additional hit is. So how does it typically present? When should we suspect it? A lot of patients actually are asymptomatic at presentations. Around half of patients with PSC are diagnosed on the basis of asymptomatic cholestatic liver tests. But where they do have symptoms, it can vary from right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, itch, or weight loss, the typical cholestatic symptoms. And they can often fluctuate And if we do suspect it, what should we do next? What are the next steps to make the diagnosis? So I I guess the very first simple test is checking their liver tests and a raised alkaline phosphatase, as you'd expect, is the most common abnormality. Really, the key diagnostic test is magnetic resonance imaging and specifically MRCP. This provides us now with a non-invasive way of getting very high-definition imaging of their biliary tree that can show the typical features. Okay, and what are the typical features? So classically, you'll see multifocal short strictures in the biliary tree, often with intervening sections that are either normal caliber or mildly dilated. And that leads to the characteristic beading appearance that's described. Would you go straight there and so let's say you had a patient with IBD that you were following up and they had cholestatic LFTs, would you go straight to MRCP? Where there's a lowish index of suspicion, I think ultrasound is usually the first investigation for cholestatic liver tests, which could show you an alternative diagnosis. But it's important to bear in mind that ultrasound in PSC is often fairly unremarkable and can be reported as completely normal. So that shouldn't put you off the diagnosis. So it's about your index of suspicion to start off with. And is autoantibody testing helpful? No, PSC is the one autoimmune liver condition where autoantibody testing is not particularly helpful. There is a recognised association between PSC and P anchor, but the sensitivity and the specificity of that are so low that it's not particularly helpful in routine practice. I guess the one exception is in patients who have got a disproportionately high ALT or AST, autoantibody testing can be helpful to look for an overlap syndrome with autoimmune hepatitis. And what about liver biopsy? Does that have a role? 
routine liver biopsy is no longer necessary for the diagnosis of PSC. So in most cases of classical PSC, liver biopsy is not required. But there are situations where it can still be helpful. One is in the diagnosis of small duct PSC. So this is patients who have the typical clinical features of PSC, but with a normal MRCP. In these situations, liver biopsy can sometimes show histological changes consistent with PSC that can clinch the diagnosis. Okay. It typically has a more benign clinical course than large duct PSC. The other situation that it can be helpful is we mentioned the overlap syndrome with autoimmune hepatitis and if that is suspected the liver biopsy can show features of autoimmune hepatitis. Okay so you're starting to touch a little bit on differentials. Are there important differentials that we have to consider? So it is important to consider causes of a secondary sclerosing cholangitis and there's a long list of these but I guess the ones that we usually think about would be trauma from previous biliary surgery, common bile duct stones, so cholodocolithiasis, or ischemia. It is recognised that you can see a secondary sclerosing cholangitis in HIV as well. Okay, what about IgG4 disease? This is all the fashion, isn't it? And I think it is now standard practice to check IgG4 levels in patients presenting with multifocal biliary stricturing. I know Dr. Church has mm -hmm. given a presentation on IgG4 associated disease, so I'll defer to that. <laughs> okay. Um, so you did mention an association with IBD. How strong is the association? The majority of PSC patients, so up to around 80%, will have underlying inflammatory bowel disease. I guess if you turn it around, though, the majority of IBD patients don't go on to develop PSC, so it's only around 7 or 8% of patients from the total IBD population that will develop PSC. And is there anything different about the pattern of IBD associated with PSC? Yes, so typically PSC patients will tend to have a pancolitis, but often with quite a marked right-sided predominance, and they can often get a backwash ileitis and rectal sparing. So that often is associated with quite mild symptoms in contrast to other patients with a pancolitis, but it's also associated with quite a significantly increased risk of colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. So patients with PSC and IBD have a tenfold increased risk of colorectal cancer compared to the general population and fivefold higher than patients with IBD without PSC. Does that mean then if you make the diagnosis of PSC, you have to go looking for IBD? Absolutely. So we've said that these patients are often relatively asymptomatic from a bowel point of view but have a significantly increased cancer risk. So all patients with PSC should undergo an index colonoscopy at diagnosis with a clonic biopsy series to look aggressively for IBD because it does change their need for surveillance. So you have an association with IBD and then also with colorectal cancer. Are there other associations that we need to be aware of? So there are sadly also other cancer risks with PSC. So it's increased, associated with an increased risk of hepatobiliary malignancies, particularly cholangiocarcinoma. Mm. And overall, patients with PSC have a lifetime incidence of between 10 and 15% for developing cholangiocarcinoma. So what's your surveillance strategy in these patients? A number of strategies have been proposed to screen for cholangiocarcinoma and some people have performed annual ultrasounds or annual MRCPs and regular tumour marker checks. So cholangiocarcinoma is associated with increased levels of carbohydrate antigen 199 or CA199 in some cases. But unfortunately, none of these strategies have been shown to be very effective at picking up cholangiocarcinoma at an early enough stage to make a difference in terms of the clinical course. The other cancer risk where there is a surveillance strategy is gallbladder cancer. That's less common mm -hmm. and probably only occurs in 2 or 3% of patients with PSC. But annual ultrasounds of the gallbladder 
are more able to detect mass lesions and if a mass lesion is found the gallbladder should be removed as there's a reasonable chance of this representing a gallbladder cancer. And what about the surveillance strategy for colorectal cancer? So any patients with PSC and IBD should have annual colonoscopies to look for dysplastic changes or malignancy. Okay. Thinking about treatment then, are there any drug treatments that improve prognosis in PSC? Sadly, no drug treatments have been shown to consistently improve prognosis. There was a recent Cochrane review which showed a lack of evidence mm. across all of the studies. The most widely used treatment is ursodeoxycholic acid or urso, and there has been some evidence in previous studies that this certainly improves the cholestatic liver enzymes, and there has been some evidence from early studies that this may improve fibrosis or histology. Unfortunately, there was then a large study looking at high-dose urso using up to 30 milligrams per kilogram per day, which was stopped prematurely due to increased adverse events in the urso group, with an increased risk of decompensation and transplantation, which I think put a lot of people off the use of urso. But I think at present, a number of clinicians would use a trial of urso to see if it improves biochemistry and continue it in responders. What about the treatment of itch? Itch in PSC can be problematic, although not as frequent as in PBC, mm. primary biliary cholangitis, but the management is very much the same. I think the first step for a patient with new or worsening itch is imaging to look for a new dominant stricture or cholangiocarcinoma that might require intervention. But beyond that then, the first medical line treatment would be Questran, a bile acid binding agent that increases the excretion in the, in the bowel. And that can be effective for some patients, but is generally quite poorly tolerated due to GI side effects. The next line treatment would be rifampicin, and that can be very effective. I think if you're going to use that, patient should be warned to look out for an orange-red discoloration, which can affect their tears and saliva and bodily fluids, because I think that can be quite startling if mm. they're not warned. And they should be counseled that there is a small risk of a drug-induced hepatotoxicity, but we've successfully used rifampicin in a number of our patients. Where that fails, the next line would be naltrexone, an oral opioid antagonist. Again, this is quite limited by side effects. And finally, sertraline has shown some promise in itch. Beyond that, there are the more experimental strategies such as nasobiliary drainage, plasmapheresis, or UV therapy, but I think those are probably best done in the setting of a transplant centre if patients have reached that stage. And as we're following patients up with PSC, is there anything else that we should be looking out for? As with chronic liver disease and particularly cholestatic liver diseases, metabolic bone disease is a concern. So patients with PSC are at an increased risk of osteoporosis. So they should be getting bone mineral density checks with a DEXA scan at diagnosis and periodically according to their other risk factors. Does ERCP have a role in management? ERCP does have a role in management. We've moved away from using it as a diagnostic test, but it still is important for assessing and dealing with strictures. I think one of the challenges is deciding when to intervene and when to leave alone. On the one hand, if there is a stricture there, it's appealing to want to try and improve drainage, particularly in patients who are symptomatic. But on the other hand, there is a risk that any instrumentation of the biliary tree can potentially introduce infection into a diffusely diseased biliary tree and increase their risks of subsequent cholangitis. What do we mean by the term dominant stricture? So a dominant stricture is just defined as a stenosis that's less than 1.5 millimetres in the common duct or less than one millimetre in the hepatic ducts. And that is seen quite commonly in patients with PSC. 
So around half of PSC patients will develop a dominant stricture at some point during their disease course. Most of those will be benign inflammatory or fibrotic strictures, but I guess the worry is that that can be the first presentation of a cholangiocarcinoma. And how would you tell? It can be quite challenging to distinguish between the two. Cross-sectional imaging can sometimes show a soft tissue mass around a stricture, which would be concerning for cancer, but that would be a very late stage, and by the time you're seeing that, you've got limited opportunity for intervention. So I guess the other way that we'd try and look is to try and get cytology to assess. So ERCP to take brushings for cytology or endoscopic ultrasound to try and get fine needle aspirates are both ways to try and assess the difference between a benign and malignant stricture. What about liver transplant for PSC? So liver transplantation is a very effective treatment for advanced PSC and outcomes are generally good. Around 30 to 40% of PSC patients will end up requiring transplantation at some point. There is a risk of disease recurrence in the transplanted liver, and it's estimated that around 20 to 30% of patients transplanted for PSC will get recurrence in their graft. It does pose some other specific challenges, so the frequent involvement of the extrahepatic biliary tree means that most of the time patients transplanted for PSC will have a hepatico jejunostomy rather than a standard duct-to-duct -duct anastomosis to remove the extrahepatic biliary tree. Is there a role just thinking more broadly for colectomy in patients with PSC? So there is some evidence that patients who have a colectomy prior to transplantation have a lower risk of recurrence after transplant. But this is based on quite small numbers and is non-randomised. So at the moment, it's not something that we would routinely recommend as a preventive strategy for, for disease recurrence. But obviously, it is still indicated in some patients for disease activity or for malignancy related to their colitis. Okay, so PSE can be a, a challenging group of patients to look after. Are there any messages you would want to leave us with? So I would agree with your comment that they are a challenging group. It's a very difficult to predict disease course. And at the moment, both the medical and endoscopic treatments are poorly understood. So I think at the moment, there's a lot of work needed to try and improve our management of it. Okay. Well, all that remains then is for me to thank you for a fantastic update on a really important condition. And thank you for joining us for Digest This.